Good evening. Tonight we go after the story of a blonde film star who resents being called England's answer to Marilyn Monroe. You see her behind me. She's Diana Doors. If you're curious to know what kind of girl becomes an international glamour queen, what kind of concessions and compromises she must make, and if you want to hear why Diana Doors says that fame isn't all it's cracked up to be, we'll go after those stories in just a minute. My name is Mike Wallace. The cigarette is Philip Morris. Philip Morris, the natural smoke with a man's kind of mildness, presents... Mike Wallace interview. We'll meet Diana Doors in just a moment. Right now, though, I'd like to take time out to ask you a question. Say you had to make a choice between mildness in your cigarette and a smoke that's not so mild. Which one would you choose? I know the answer I'd give. Here, today's Philip Morris. That's my answer. Why? Because Philip Morris has what I call a man's kind of mildness. You see, the taste of this tobacco is fresh and easy and natural, and yet there's a mildness here that any smoker will enjoy, which is why I say, if the cigarette you're now smoking isn't as mild as you think it should be, then this could be your answer, too. Here is natural mildness. No filter, no foolin', no artificial mildness. In fact, no filter is needed because, you see, the mildness comes from the tobacco itself. When you try this up-to-date smoke, I think you'll see what I mean about a man's kind of mildness. Get with today's Philip Morris. And now to our story. Diana Doors is one of England's leading film stars. A bosomy blonde bundle with a flair for publicity that is extraordinary even by American standards. The daughter of a railway clerk, or Clark, Miss Doors, like so many Hollywood actresses, has wanted to be a star since she was a child. And her success as a blonde bombshell in films has been meteoric, thanks in large part to her ready wit and her ability to carry off such publicity stunts as sailing down Venice's Grand Canal in a gondola while clad in a mink bikini. Diana, first of all, let me ask you this. Americans, I believe, traditionally think of the British as being emotionally cool, undemonstrative people. And then along comes Diana Doors, platinum blonde, clad in low-cut gowns, except tonight, sometimes, I think you'll agree, brassy, issuing colorful statements to the press. How do you account for such a rare British phenomenon as Diana Doors? Well, Mike, I, I don't really consider myself a phenomenon at all, and um, uh, if, uh, if you or anybody else went to England, I'm sure you would find just as many other uh, glamorous, um, uh, colorful people as oh, no, myself. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Diana. Truth to tell, when we think about uh, Hollywood stars, we think possibly of Marilyn Monroe, Jane Mansfield, that kind of person. You go to Italy and it's Sophia Loren or, or Lola Gina Lola Bridget and so forth. England, Vivian Lee, Deborah Carr, Wendy Hiller, it's a different type of person. You seem to be, in a sense, in a class by yourself for an English woman. Yes, I, I suppose I am, Mike. Uh, yes, when you put it like that. Of course, there are uh, a, a great many uh, very glamorous, undiscovered British girls, you know, who are just waiting for the, for the chance to show themselves well, in the I'm, way that I've been lucky enough to. I'm certain of that. But how do you account? How do you account for the fact that evidently the British aren't interested in producing more like you have, who have reached top rank? Well, I think that uh, the British are certainly very interested in it, but as yet, maybe it has something to do with the British temperament of being a little cool and a little reserved. They don't quite know how to go about this and, and bring this kind of personality out. And if it suddenly happens, as in my case, and I don't know how it did, I don't think they, they really know what to do with it. Well, perhaps you yourself once hinted at what I'm driving at. As a matter of fact, you've said it in a sense uh, right now. An article about you in Time magazine, October 10th, 1955, said this. Miss Doris feels that English film directors are wary of sex. Mm -hmm. She says, I don't think they quite know what to do with it. What do you mean by that? 
Well, I, I don't think that... Uh, you see, Britain has made so many films which uh, have not been on the the kind of uh, sex basis as, as opposed to Hollywood. Now, you know, don't get me wrong when I say that. I mean, Hollywood uh, and Hollywood films and, and producers, I think, are the greatest showmen in the world. I, I think America has a natural flair for showmanship. And uh, always there is usually a blonde who is a kind of sex symbol of the, of the country, of the industry for a time, and then she moves out and somebody else moves in. Uh, apart from that, there, there are a lot of other very glamorous uh, stars in Hollywood, and uh, they, they seem to build stories around them, stories that the public would like to go and see. They need not necessarily be classics, but they are box office. Well, by the same token, now, we were in Europe fairly recently, and I must say that Jane Mansfield was accepted by your public. Oh, yes, they love her. <laughs> Indeed, they... Uh, do you think that England has any more restrained an attitude towards sex than the United no, States? No, I don't at all. And, uh, England, I think it, I think that uh, facts show that probably the, the fans and, and the public in England are, are just as enthusiastic as they are in the United States or anywhere else in the world. Diana, how do you personally like all that your career demands, day in and day out, and I mean appearing in daring gowns and striking provocative poses for newspaper photographers, even sailing down Venice's Grand Canal in a gondola while clad in a mink bikini. How do you really feel about doing all that? Well, Mike, uh, at the time that I did all those things, I felt that it was an essential part of the, of the work that I was doing. Uh, although some people may have frowned on it, especially when I call it work. It may sound a very silly word. But um, as far as the uh, Venice incident with the mink bikini was concerned, uh, I did that because so many columnists were ringing me up and saying, well, what are you going to wear at the festival this year? They expected me to wear something outstanding, something spectacular. And I dreamed up the mink bikini because I thought it might be just what they wanted. I can understand you're doing this, mm -hmm. you? What I'm asking is what Diana Doors uh, really feels inside. Do, do you like making an exhibition of yourself in that fashion? No, I don't. Uh, you see, we're really talking about two different people. We're talking about the Diana Dawes that the, that the world knows as a kind of publicity film actress who, who on the face of things, likes to go out and be seen at premieres and nightclubs and uh, wearing low-cut gowns and striking provocative poses, as you say. But the the other Diana Dawes, which is the one that I, I am inside, really doesn't like any of these things at all. Well, now, what things do you dislike most? This seems like the conventional thing to say, mm -hmm. so if you will, tell me what, what you dislike most and what you'd really like to do. Well, the things that I dislike, um, although it may sound strange, I hate going out. And In fact, in, in England, I, I, I never go out at all. I don't like nightclubs. I don't like going to premieres. Or, or going around where what is commonly known as the sort of smart places to be. Um, the only time that I, I have ever showed up at these places has been when there is a premiere or when there is something that publicity-wise they say you should be seen. The other side of me would much rather stay at home, uh, invite friends down, talk, swim, play tennis, and ge generally just loaf around and not have to get dressed and made up or anything. <laughs> well, now, how long have you been doing this other thing? Oh, this other thing I have been doing ever since I started in the business because I... And you see, started I, at a fairly early age. I believe that you started, uh, did you not, in the same uh, way that Marilyn Monroe started? You, you posed in the altogether for... Uh, photographers and uh, as, as a model, did you not? Uh, no, I didn't, Mike, no. I, uh, I started when I was 14. I was given a, a, a part in a film, mm -hmm. and uh, by the time I was 15, I was under contract to the rank organization, and um, I had made something like 23 pictures by the time I was 17. Well, then you obviously have more money than you know what to do with. Why don't you decide to chuck the whole thing and be the person that you say that you would like to be? Well, I haven't got more money than I know what to do with. <laughs> I wish I had. <laughs> because if I had, I probably would do just that, Mike. But I am going towards the goal. And uh, how long it will take me, I don't know. I hope it will be soon. What's your goal? My goal is to have a farm in England and settle down and raise a family and forget the whole thing. <laughs> really? Really and truly. There's a book called Hollywood, The Dream Factory, by a woman by the name of Hortense Powdermaker. She says this about stars. She says that the motion picture industry stresses the 
look at me, look at my body types, their life at home, their parties, even the details of their sleeping attire, pajamas and no pajamas. Everything accents look at me. Mm -hmm. It's a way of life, mm -hmm. not just a means of earning a living. Mm -hmm. Now, do you disagree when Ms. Powdermaker says that you've not just chosen a profession, but a way of life? It must be so ingrained into you now. No, not at all. I don't, I don't think, I, I, I think she is wrong when she says it's a, it's a way of life. I think that the sort of things that people read about uh, film stars and what they sleep in and what they do and that kind of thing. Usually the work of, of, of publicity departments and... Uh, oh, but Diane, how can you disassociate yourself from this that is a fabric of your life, day in and day out? For instance, just a few days uh, back, uh, you and one of our reporters went to a restaurant here in New York mm -hmm. during the lunch hour, and I'm told that as you stepped into the uh, restaurant, a, a couple of hundred people looked up and opened their mouths and stopped eating and remarks were passed, one thing or another. Now, you mean to say that you don't really get some honest satisfaction out of that. I get a satisfaction out of the fact that people recognize me because when I started in this business, uh, it was my genuine ambition to become um, a well-known film actress. And this part of it, I get a, a terrific kick out of. Mm. And, and they say, there is a saying, that when people don't recognize you, don't ask you for your autograph, that's the time you should worry. And I quite agree. Mm. But uh, at the same time, you know, it can, after a while, you begin to realize the, the tremendous uh, strain of being a well-known personality. I mean, when, when I started, I had no idea of the sort of things that would, that would happen and, and, and what it would entail as far as not being able to go to places that I really would like to go to because people stare and people maybe make remarks, and uh, maybe I wouldn't be expected to be seen in the place anyway. Do you and like the way you look? Do I? Mm -hmm. Well, not all the time I don't, but... <laughs> Generally speaking, you, rather, you, you find yourself attractive. Oh, no, I wouldn't say that. No, I, 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 I get so, so, so bored with looking at myself in the mirror every day. <laughs> well, I think that's probably true uh, of all of us. But when I say, do you like the way you look? Do you like the long I hair? I try to make the most of myself. The blonde hair. And you obviously play up what attributes that you have. You, oh, I do. You are yeah. proud of the way you look. I am not proud of the way I look, Mike, but I... I try to make the most of myself, and I try to appear in the, in the best way possible. Do you ever yearn to look or act or be? And now, please understand the sense in which I say this to you. More what is commonly known as a lady. Do you ever have a yearning to cut your hair and be, um, and wear tailored things and be a little tweedier? No, I don't want to be tweedier at all. <laughs> but I don't think that being a lady has anything to do with cutting one's hair. <laughs> I have my hair long purely and solely because it suits me, and if it was short, it would look terrible. And in my wardrobe, uh, if you ever cared to look, you'd find an awful lot of tailored things. Do you think that the average ordinary-looking woman watching this program tonight has any real reason to envy you your appearance? Oh, well, that's a very difficult question. You know, I, I, I find some people do, and a lot of people just, just loathe the way I look and everything I represent. Why do you think the, the average man or woman is so fascinated by people like yourself, fascinated by your clothes, with what you say, with stunts like wearing the mink bikini? Well, what, what is it that, that makes this so interesting to so many of us? Well, um... Uh I don't know. I, I think maybe it's because um, I am representing a, a larger-than-life kind of character, uh, one that is completely detached from the everyday, normal kind of life that most people lead. And maybe some people um, have a secret yearning to, to do the things that I do and wear the kind of clothes I wear. Maybe it's, maybe it's a kind of dream. I don't know. Is it possible that a good many of us are so bored with our own lives that we crave the vicarious excitement of reading and hearing about the hijinks of people like yourself? <laughs> I don't know. There are probably a lot of people who say they couldn't care less anyway. But I do know that um, people uh, in, in, in films, the word film star and glamorous blonde and that kind of thing fascinates a lot of people. And, and I, I think in, in, in many, many people there is a hidden desire to be 
to be famous and to be glamorous and, and to do all the things that they've only ever dreamed about. Well, this obviously was the case with you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I was very young. In fact, all my life, I, it was a childhood dream of mine to become a film star. Now, um, now that you're a film star, is it all that it's cracked up to be? No. All right, tell us why. But really tell us. All right, well, uh, when, I, when I first began, I had dreams of being a glamorous film star, like the film stars that I had seen on the screen and I had read about. And I thought, what a wonderful life it must be. You don't work hard, you, you lie around in satins and silks all day, and you have everybody sort of fawning over you. But when you have been in the business, for a certain length of time, you first of all come to realize that nobody gets there in the first place without a lot of hard work, disappointments, and heartbreaks. Compromises? Yes. Compromises with your own honesty? Yes. Have you, have you, have you done things, frankly, over the past, let's say, ten years, uh, of which you're ashamed in order to achieve this success that you now have? Uh, I'm not asking for any true no, confessions. No, no, right? no, no, no. I'm not ashamed of anything I've done. Oh, no, far from mm -hmm. it. I think that um, my publicity, although some of it has been colorful and some of it, as in the case of this Hollywood swimming pool incident, which I'm sure everybody knows about by now, mm -hmm. was certainly unwanted and, and I could have done without. But I am I'm not ashamed of anything I've done. I would hate to be ashamed of anything. I would hate to, to look back on my life and say, oh, if I only had it over again, I would be different and I would do this differently. Mm -hmm. But you, I, I, I interrupted you. You were saying that there are many things, or certain things, that just make it not worth the candle. Not all that it's cracked up. Of course, everything in life has a price. I mean, there have been times when I have been very unhappy and people have said to me, well, that is the price you pay for your swimming pool and your, your Cadillac and all the, the good things of life that you have. Oh, your, your unhappiness. What, specifically, what, what kinds of unhappiness? Oh, I don't... Well, when I say unhappiness, I mean, you know, personal problems and, and um, worries about the future and about security and growing old and all, all the little things that people worry about. Does growing old really concern you? No, it doesn't. No, I, I, I don't mind it very much. I, I can't really imagine myself old. <laughs> Maybe that's why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I say growing old, I mean does becoming less attractive, losing the, your, your, your figure a little bit, and uh, getting wrinkles. Well, you know, in many ways, I think one day when it finally happens, I'm going to rather enjoy that because then I won't have to bother how I look anymore. I would imagine <laughs> there'd be a tremendous amount of tension. Oh, tremendous amount it of is. Of it is because all the time, you know, you're on show, you have to be absolutely impeccably dressed and not a hair out of place. You know, we've been reading scores of newspaper clippings about you that date back several years. And a hint of disillusion appeared back in November of 56 in an interview with syndicated columnist Joe Hyam. Speaking of your five-month stay in Hollywood, you said, I just don't know what it is about Hollywood that's so upsetting. They speak English there, but it's like being in a foreign country. What do you mean by that? Well, Mike, uh, now to start with, um, much as I, I like and respect Joe Hyam and his writing, I didn't exactly say that very statement. I certainly didn't say that I found Hollywood upsetting. I probably said that although and I was referring to America when I said this. Although we all speak the same language, I think that we are, we are in many ways um, foreign to one another in our, in our ways. I mean, what you were saying earlier about the British being cool and reserved. I mean, the Americans are far from being that. I think we have a different way of life, uh, different senses of humor, and, and, and generally are different. But I certainly didn't find that Hollywood upset me. On the contrary. You came here, I remember so well. You came here, how long ago was it for the first time? Uh, about a year and a half. A little, about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And you came with such a tremendous publicity yes. and so much goodwill. Mm -hmm. And I rather felt uh, that when you left, it had not been a totally satisfactory experience for you. No, it hadn't. Now, do you blame that on Diana Doors or do you blame that on Hollywood? I blame it on both. What did Diana Doors do wrong? Well, I don't know whether I did anything wrong, but I suppose coming here with this terrific blaze of publicity and being the kind of sex symbol blonde, I, as not in the case of Hollywood, but uh, everywhere in the world, set myself up in a position to be knocked down like a skittle. And um, this I was in Hollywood more than, more than anywhere else I have ever been. Mm -hmm. 
You uh, resent Hollywood for doing it to you? No, no, I think everybody has a perfect right to say exactly what they feel and what they think, and uh, I don't resent Hollywood for, 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 uh, for saying a lot of the things that it did about me. I don't mind constructive criticism. What did Hollywood do wrong to Diana Doors? Well, first of all, there was the swimming pool incident, which, which was a terrible thing and which upset me a great deal because, apart from anything else, everybody thought that it was a publicity stunt on my part, mm -hmm. and it wasn't. And uh, I thought that the way the, the photographer who actually pushed us all in behave was very bad, considering he was in, in our house accepting our hospitality. I believe that's in litigation right now, so it's probably just as well not to talk about it. Oh. <laughs> uh, but aside from that? Um, aside from that? Didn't you, in a sense, ask for what you got? No, I don't think so. No. Why do you resent being called England's answer to Marilyn Monroe? Last year, Luella Parsons quoted you as saying, I wish I could be called something other than England's Marilyn Monroe. What's, mm -hmm. the, what, what's wrong with being England's Marilyn Monroe? Well, to start with, I think that there is only one Marilyn Monroe. There could never be any other. And therefore, I don't want to sort of be a, a carbon copy of, of Marilyn. Uh, I want to be England's Diana Dawes. <laughs> Perfectly. Which I am at home. <laughs> Perfectly understandable. Diana, in a moment, I'd like to ask you about something you said recently about the private lives of film stars. You said, any star who gets involved in politics is a fool. And in a moment, I'd like to know why you think that. We'll get the answer to that question in less than 60 seconds. Something's new here, but it isn't the melody. That's a grand old classic. It's the piano that's new. They just moved it in. There's something else new here, too. Philip Morris. You'll know the minute you smoke Philip Morris. Try them and see. Philip Morris tastes natural. And people who try it, like it. They also like the man's kind of mildness in Philip Morris. No filter, no fooling. Nothing artificial between you and the tobacco itself. The box is crush-proof. Keeps your cigarettes firm and fresh from first to last. Smoke to Philip Morris lately? Get with it. Natural taste, man's kind of mildness, crush-proof box. Get with Philip Morris. Probably the best natural smoke you ever tasted. Get with Philip Morris, the natural smoke with a man's kind of mildness. Now then, Diana, a few days ago you told our reporter, quote, in my opinion, any star who gets involved in politics is a fool. Surely you wouldn't want to entrust our politics exclusively to professional politicians. No, uh, I think that it is perfectly all right for, for actors to have their own private opinions about politics, but I think it's, it's a very bad thing for their careers to, to start getting heavily involved in them as in the case of, of many people who, who have become involved in this communistic thing and have finished their wonderful careers completely stone dead. Now, what do you mean, who, who have got, people who have gotten involved in this communist thing and have finished their careers? Well, uh, would you like me to mention some names? Would it matter? Mm, it depends, because obviously we don't want to tag anybody <laughs> no, unnecessarily. No, of course not. Well, shall we say that, I mean, in particular, I'm thinking of, of two big and very wonderful Hollywood stars mm -hmm. who have uh, openly confessed to becoming communists or being communists mm -hmm. and because of this their their talent their genius and everything has been completely sidestepped and now their their careers are are all washed up well uh, just because one gets involved in politics doesn't necessarily mean that one has to wind up becoming a communist oh I agree I agree I am taking this thing a little too far this way well, certainly I every citizen has a has a right yes. and really the duty to express himself or herself politically yes. mm -hmm. um, again we come to what seems to be uh, if I may go on for just an instant mm -hmm. the uh, unhappy story of Diana Dors, who has devoted herself so exclusively to her career mm -hmm. that she has left a certain part of her life fallow. Mm -hmm. And what you're suggesting is that in the effort for career, you forget about everything else, or not everything else, but you forget about the fairly important 
other things that make a human being? No, I don't think you forget them. But I think uh, if you're thinking about the public and the effect that you're having on the public, you should be a little careful before you start saying things uh, openly. Well, because uh, you, you mean to say that you would disaffect a part of your public if you were to announce that you were either on the side of the Labour Party or you were on the side of the Conservative Party in England? I think so. I think if I suddenly announced that I was Conservative, I would probably lose thousands and thousands of, of Labour fans because people are funny. I find politics brings out the worst in people more than anything else. For some strange reason. I don't know why. I'm not terribly interested in politics anyway. Really? No. Have you ever voted in a British election? No, I haven't. I've only, I've only been old enough to vote once, which was, uh, I think, well, the, the last general election. And at the time, uh, I, have never, I have never studied politics uh, at all, and I didn't really see the reason why I should go and put a sign down or something that I didn't understand and didn't know. Aside from your profession, Diana, what interests you? What excites you? Oh, everything. I love to talk. I love to... Well, of course you like to talk. Now, what do you like to talk about? What? Anything. Anything rather than the profession. <laughs> Have you ever studied anything? Have you ever really been involved in anything? No, I haven't, unfortunately, because it hasn't left me time to be involved or to, to take up anything seriously. But along the side, when I'm, not, when I'm not appearing anywhere, when I'm not working in a film, I like to sort of creep around and find out things. Mm -hmm. Find out well, now I imagine, people. in as much as you're going to turn farmer shortly, that you'll be reading agricultural books. That's for sure. <laughs> Diana, I thank you so much for coming and spending this time with us. And thank continue. you, Mike. Good luck to you. Thank you for having me. Though her mother tongue is English, Diana Dors, in her own very special way, speaks an international language. Her ample proportions and seductive glances have quickened the pulse of male audiences from Brooklyn to Bangkok. No small achievement. Matter of fact, Britain's Diana Dors is a rather convincing argument for friendly relations among all nations. Because I smoke Philip Morris and because I represent them on the air on this program, I'm naturally interested whenever I see pe uh, people smoking this cigarette. And lately, I've noticed one thing. More people are smoking Philip Morris. Now, it may be this crush-proof box that's doing it, but I think it's probably more than that. I'm sure it's what's inside, inside here. What is it? A man's kind of mildness. No filter, no fooling, no artificial mildness. No filter is needed, you see, because the mildness comes from the tobacco itself. Get with Philip Morris. I think you'll like a man's kind of mildness, too. Next week, live, we go after the story of a phenomenon of our times, a woman who has called herself fat and unattractive. Despite the fact that she attracts the admiration and sometimes the hatred of kings and queens, dukes and duchesses, millionaires and society matrons. You see her behind me, she's Elsa Maxwell, the queen of international party making and a caustic social critic. If you'd like to know how Miss Maxwell has become a power in international society, her answer to the charge that her circle of friends is immoral and decadent, and why Miss Maxwell says that she is bored by Perry Como and Arthur Godfrey, We'll go after those stories next week. Till then, for Philip Morris, Mike Wallace, good night. The Mike Wallace interview is brought to you by Philip Morris Incorporated, the Quality House. He dealt with the lawless in forceful fashion. Meet Maverick tomorrow. Monday night, join singing star Guy Mitchell on ABC Television Network.